immense grace we commence the meditation on verse number 6 of the text ullad 40 the sixth verse goes like this ulagai pulangal uruveran ravaim pulanai porik pulana உலகை மனம் ஒன்றையும் பொறிவாயால் ஓர்ந்திடுதலான் மனத்தை அன்றி உலகுண்டோ வரை நேரே உலகை புலன்கள் உருவேரன்றவையும் புலனையும் பொறிக்கு புலனாம் உலகை மனம் ஒன்றையும் பொறிவாயால் ஓர்ந்திடுதலான் மனத்தை அன்றி உலகுண்டோ வரை நேரே நமோ ரமணா டு கெட் இன் டு சம் கான்டெக்ட் வி ஹாவ் கான் த்ரூ தி ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஃபோர் வர்சஸ் விச் கவர் தி ஆத்மா the ishvara for the first cause the third verse is about ulag the world and the fourth verse is about the ego purvam <coughs> tanayin ulag paramatra we had seen that the fifth sixth and seventh in this chapter of viveka they completely look at the world once and for all and put our attention on the right direction so to say that is to turn inward <clears throat> we had seen that verse number 5 was could be treated as a stand alone verse it had complete sense in itself so it can be considered as part of the 5 6 7 group <clears throat> because the verse was udal pancha kosha uruvadanal aindum udal ennum sollil odungum udal andri undo ulagam udal vittu ulagathai kandar ularo kalaruvai so that was the fifth verse and we had taken reference from taitriya upanishad and a book on aitriya and taitriya by professor by swami ji krishnanand ji from shivananda ashram and <clears throat> that is a stand alone verse that is can there be a world apart from the body which includes the pancha koshas or the three bodies of gross subtle and causal and once these three the gross subtle and crossal are crossed or the pancha koshas are crossed by enquiry is there any world left to be pursued perceived or enquired into was the import of the verse so it can be a stand alone verse also we will find that verse number 6 and 7 give a combined meaning <clears throat> though in one sense seven can stand alone if one can appreciate the content of mind directly but six and seven they go together because one takes us from senses to the mind and the seventh verse takes us from mind to the atma so having got some context into where we are 
let us go into the verse this is of course about the jnanendriyas so before we even go into the verse the reference that i would like to give is there is a video in the youtube modern neuroscientists neurobiologists going into reality of reality the tale of five senses <clears throat> it's a discussion which brings out the limitations of the five senses the scientists also agree that the senses do not have the capacity to show us anything stable or uh, let alone a glimpse of reality that is practically impossible is their finding but they have certain derivatives out of that we will go into that as we go into the verse before we go into the verse even as i had given the reference in the youtube to the modern uh, scientists findings which could even change with the later scientists coming and finding something else but that is the present reference we have on uh, practical enquiry into senses the other thing that we have is this uh, legend the the tale of the blind man and the elephant which he said to have originated from india and it is used in uh, many countries across the world now but the tale can be applied to the jnanendriyas the five jnanendriyas they can be treated as blind men because they are blind in all other aspects other than the one aspect for which they are fine tuned <clears throat> for instance the eyes cannot smell now the to recall the story briefly of the five blind men and the elephant is that it could be six also <clears throat> because nowadays the sense of balance that we have in the labyrinth between the ears that is also treated as that is uh, giving the spatial presence for us where we are in space and giving us a balance that is treated as sixth sense by neurologists <clears throat> therefore there are six blind men in the story one touching the trunk and calling it like a big uh, snake python then one touching the ears calling the elephant to be nothing but a huge fan handheld fan <clears throat> one touching the legs refuting the other two saying that the elephant is nothing but a pillar and one touching the sides calling it a wall and the one touching the tail calling it a rope and the sixth one touching the <clears throat> tusks calls it a fine sharp pointed object <clears throat> now lots of details are given about how the six try to put their data together but it can never give the whole elephant they also have fights from time to time so the story goes on like that because each of them have only imperfect knowledge and very imperfect knowledge at that try what you may you will never get the truth of the elephant by putting together or analyzing or trying to fight each other out no way the reality is going to be found through the senses so that is the beginning that on that point all are agreed vedantins uh, spiritualists and even today scientists they agree that senses are highly unreliable witnesses to what is happening we'll go into the verse and then get into the discussion proper the verse is ulagain <coughs> pulangal uru veru adre ulagain pulangal uru veru andre that means in in one sense and <clears throat> in a practical sense the world is not a collection of objects 
present there but he is only sensory forms he is only sensory forms present there <coughs> uh, the clue in one of the discussions in the video you will see that if you take the sense of smell none of the chemical compounds we smell have smell in them <coughs> none of them have smell but the smell is something that is interior that is inside us and for the purpose of survival they say the scientists for this purpose of survival the living beings have recognized have the ability to recognize certain objects for their own survival <coughs> as good bad healthy and other things through the sense of smell so there is really no sense of smell in that object <coughs> in the coffee that is brewing there is really no sense of smell <coughs> but the sense of smell is detected by our own senses which is an interior thing which we will see later as we go <coughs> that it is they all agree that it is a uh, <coughs> it is a user interface provided by uh, life or god it is a user interface which we all have in common at each species has a different user interface more about that later but it is nothing more than a user interface it is not reality the sense <coughs> but here ulagaim pulangal uru ver andre that means the world is nothing but the world is nothing but sensory forms the sense of sight so if sense of smell is not there the sense of sight there in the object <coughs> obviously not it's a world in which we live that in the object itself if you have to go to the root of this you'll have to go that real existence comes only when one is conscious of one's existence <coughs> like uh, if somebody is in a very happy situation according to others what we call as aggregation of objects but he is not aware of it then obviously that is not happiness at all even in the relative sense so <clears throat> really speaking unless one is aware of one's existence that can on, cannot be called as existence but more about that i am just jumping the situation because of the topic at hand <clears throat> it is very interesting that how we are uh, loaded with the sensory information throughout the day and take it for granted without investigating so that is the sense of this verse and this combined with the next verse will give us a picture of where we have to look ulagai pulangal uru veru andre what are these five uh, senses the sense of seeing the sense of smell the sense of uh, touch <coughs> the sense of hearing and the sense of taste the rasa all these five put together they are called as jnanendriyas they are the data providers in one sense in fact that data is not there <coughs> that data is created from within and the scientists uh, not in a relatively untrue way they say that these are developed uh, for the purpose of surviving in the relative situation of keeping alive keeping the jeeva alive but more of that later ulagaim pulangal uruverendra so what bhagwan is saying here what we popularly consider that the mango is really a mango there is an object made of atoms here bhagwan is saying no <coughs> unless those atoms are perceived <coughs> they really don't have any kind of existence so it is actually a pulan uru it is a sense of smell a sense of uh, uh, sight and a sense of spatial presence uh, all these three the sixth sense if you include all these three put together we get the perception of the mango in that particular distance from us so the mango is not a collection of uh, uh, things or matter in according to this verse it has moved from that <clears throat> where it has moved it has moved into a little bit more real situation of it is nothing but a sensory form pulan uru <clears throat> it is nothing but a sensory form there 
ulagaim pulangal it could be a combination of various senses but still an aggregation of various blind man gathering their data and bringing it in ulagaim pulangal uruver anru aim uruver anru aim pulanaim porikka pulanam this is uh, five sensory forms all this that is the world is nothing but made of the five sensory forms these five sensory forms are perceived by the five senses so what is ulag what is the world world is nothing but the form of senses the uru the uru created by the senses <coughs> now the scientists feel that there is an independent reality there which the senses hack or give us a shortcut or give us a, some information about <coughs> whereas bhagwan and vedanta don't consider that we will go into that but i'm just introducing so that we understand the depth of the sentences that ulagain pulangal uruver anru aim pulanain porikku pulanam those five sensory forms which is now the world are now graha they are now perceived by the five indriyas the five senses of seeing smelling tasting touching and hearing so all these only are there there is nothing like sound there <clears throat> in the matter world there is nothing like sound there is only movement of waves which the system within us and the brain and the mind together they detect as sound <clears throat> they detect they call it as sound and they make sense of it but otherwise there is no sound there there is no sight there there is no taste there there is no smell there <clears throat> independent of the indriyas ulagain pulangal uruver aim pulanaim porikku pulana all those five forms of sensory forms are perceived by the dynamic senses the senses which are more conscious than sensory forms that is what sri krishna says in <coughs> bhagavad gita where he says indriyani paranyahu indriyebhya param manaha manasastu para buddhi yo buddhe para tastu saha the indriyas are more powerful than the world perceived than the forms of indriya perceived indriyani paran yahu indriyebhya param manaha more powerful than indriyas is the mind which is what we are going to see in the next two sentences ulagain pulangal uruveran ravvain pulanain porik pulanam all those five sensory forms are perceived <coughs> or sensed by the five senses ulagibanam ஒன்று ஐம் பொறி வாயால் ஓர்ந்திடுதலால் மனத்தை அன்றி உலகுண்டோ அரை நேரே டெல் ஸ்ட்ரைட் ஃபார்வர்ட்லி அரை நேரே சின்ஸ் தி ஒன் மைண்ட் சின்ஸ் தி ஒன் மைண்ட் ஹேவிங் ஆக்டிங் ஆஸ் தி சப்போர்ட் ஆஸ் தி சிங்குலர் சப்போர்ட் ஆஃப் தி ஃபைவ் சென்சஸ் அண்ட் த்ரூ தி ஃபைவ் சென்சஸ் perceiving the five sensory forms which is the world <coughs> can there be a world apart or independent of or standing on its own apart from the mind <coughs> so that is the sentences that is the meaning of the content of the verse let us put it together the world is not a collection of objects matter but it is better seen as the form of senses the sensory forms that are there this this room is nothing but a sensory form <clears throat> this world is nothing but a sensory form perceived by <clears throat> the five senses and since the mind the one mind <clears throat> perceives the world through the five senses can there be a world apart from or independent of the mind 
in sanskrit of course the words manomayam tad bhuvanam vadamaha is the finishing we had that the world is nothing but permeated completely by the mind stuff the thought stuff so that is the putting together of the verse what we see as the world now is just sensory forms <coughs> either seen separately or as a collection of the five in various combinations <coughs> but perceived by always the five independent senses which try like the five blind men to put together data sometimes conflictingly <coughs> sometimes coordinatedly let's say most of the times coordinatedly but still always partial data trying to be aggregated and try to get a sense of reality and work on that <coughs> but all these five senses are felt and the world is perceived through these five senses activating the five senses by the mind therefore can the world be independent or apart from or standing alone away from the mind <coughs> in sanskrit bhagwan finishes it by saying manomayam tad bhuvanam vadama it is said that what is seen as the world of objects which was brought down to sensory forms which was brought down to senses is nothing but made of mind stuff that is thoughts once again we go back and recollect the talk briefly between the solicitor's daughter who has come and who asks bhagwan i leave certain early parts of that talk is this my is this world nothing but my thoughts bhagwan says the world was not perceived in deep sleep where there was no thoughts and as soon as you get up there are thoughts and there is the world what else can the world be except thought forms except thoughts which have expanded as the intelligence as well as the content of what is perceived as the world <coughs> so the this verse and the next verse put together bhagwan will make us turn inward uh, from the sensory world into the mind and the source of the mind we had seen earlier that these three verses verse number 5 uh, 6 and 7 their primary intent is to drive home the upadesha of bhagwan of turn inward we would have seen seen in many many instances bhagwan giving us this upadesha of turning inward <coughs> which is so simply given by bhagwan but uh, it is a major gift it's a major major gift in the area of uh, spiritual quest spiritual sadhana <coughs> a small example or instance that had happened in my own uh, journey there was this uh, there was this uh, travel by train from chennai to bangalore it was last minute and i was quite young so i didn't mind traveling by the unreserved compartment and i like standing by the door side where the wind is heavy and i somehow have this uh, <coughs> happiness in looking at the kilometer stones go by those electric poles are all divided into 16 each kilometer is divided into 16 parts and somehow i keep track of which station comes at what kilometer and all that <coughs> that i was doing that and incidentally in our compartment the unreserved compartments are sometimes separated into 2 3 so those 2 3 compartments alone form they are not connected to the main body of the train so we had uh, four or five uh, people who came in seeking arms and i had found that uh, it happened over the 3 4 hours it took to come to Ch jolar pet from chennai to jolar pet <coughs> one person was blind and he had a friend and they were singing some songs and they had collected money one person was giving a card about her problem of being a mute and she could collect she on her left hand she had some 10 rupee 5 rupee notes indirectly indicating 
what should be given <coughs> and a third person had a different kind of problem but uh, she could communicate what the problem was and she could get arms from kind people but all this time a person was curled up near the corridor near the door <coughs> he was curled up and he was not mentally fit <coughs> from the look of it uh, he did not have the mental strength to organize himself and go for begging or do other things he was curled up like that and by the time uh, jolar pet was nearing in the earlier stop a person was selling some puffed rice it was about 10 15 rupees and uh, all the people because they were all in that set of compartments including the people who had sought the arms the four of them all four of them they had purchased one of the packets from this gentleman and i in my mind worked out that this person who is having the mental difficulty is the worst off is the most difficultly placed person and i bought the some amount and was feeling good about myself <clears throat> and i used to generally have the feeling that those who don't have that strength of organizing their mind they are the worst off and i had also worked out that all of us who are so called well organized also are in some ways we are showing our disability and seeing what the senses are we are displaying our inability <coughs> at arriving at the truth and somehow there is usefulness for the world in that and the world gives us something that's how we all survive so i had worked out the whole picture that we were all having one disability or the other somehow those disabilities had some use or was uh, looked favorably by some and some keeping the jiva going was possible but these people were especially uh, <coughs> in trouble therefore i had to do something there so i kept i had to do something there for 2 3 years like that <coughs> then at one point in the atma vicharam jarmi i understood that was i not part of that picture was i not part of that picture where i had construed i had construed the whole picture like that some other person may construe the whole picture from a different perspective maybe uh, an art form is found wanting and they want to contribute in that art some people may found a health uh, aspect wanting in that picture they may want to contribute in the health area some other person in the engineering area some other person in some other area <clears throat> but i had found the picture imperfect there but in my inner journey bhagwan or the <clears throat> intuition that came was was i not part of the picture why why did i take myself out of the picture <clears throat> if i consider myself as part of the picture as should any other player in that person who found that picture to be imperfect then what happens was i not given Th- that person who was given a disability which i considered worse than others was i not given some instinct to give him that means the picture had provided compensation for that inside the picture itself <clears throat> inside the picture itself it had provided that is when we are able to step out of the picture <clears throat> when we see the picture as needing nothing from us as being run by one force which takes care of which balances everything and what we found in a complete picture as that part of imperfection in which we wanted to contribute if we also step ourselves inside as a limited being into the picture we are able to get the whole picture the sensory picture that we get the mental picture that we get the picture of intentions that we get so we were discussing two <coughs> two of us were discussing this in tirunamalai and the point came out that uh, we do work out that it is not uh, it is not a question of giving even if i had not had the money that day to give uh, to give the 15 rupees we worked out the two of us discussing we worked out it would have been all right because my intent was there the intent to help was there therefore it should have been all right i shouldn't have felt bad about myself then we both worked out <coughs> in one sense the picture is made of sensory objects in one sense it is made of sensory forms in another sense it is made the picture the whole world picture 
is made of intents good and bad intents and somehow we had found that the picture had some deficiency in good intent that's why we become a doer in that <clears throat> the moment we feel that we understand that are we not who saw the whole picture and having one deficiency were we not part of that picture <clears throat> at that moment of knowing doing is replaced by knowing <clears throat> the whole area of doing is transcended by knowing that that one power is there which has created the picture which will complete it which will complete it not as a collection of sensory objects but as an intuition that we have inside that it must be so <clears throat> now this is a problem that the scientists who are in the video will have what they have is that the question there and the question here which i had promised earlier uh, to reveal later that promissory note let us encash now <clears throat> that <clears throat> i had said that the scientists have a problem that there is an independent reality there which is somehow warped or uh, shown deficiently by the senses that is more or less the sense you will get from the video <clears throat> but one of the scientists mr hoffman he he goes a little bit more differently from that he moves towards the vedantic perspective that the very neurons the very neurons of which the brain is made is an illusion <clears throat> the very neurons are not a reality is the point he comes but i leave it to you to look at the video and see <clears throat> uh, how most of them consider that there is a reality in the world but the senses they somehow warp it <clears throat> how they explain is very interesting how they explain is that if you go and stand in front of a bus what will happen <clears throat> is that not real now i would like one of you to respond what is the problem with this idea that <clears throat> there is an independent reality there we for instance if you go and stand in front of a bus will it not hit you is the statement of that neurologist who talks about the reality of reality the video is called reality of reality can anyone respond as to uh, what is the hitch in that explanation okay <clears throat> the hitch is that yeah yes sir ka <laughs> it's uh, to say it very briefly in my favorite example is like the dream the hitch is that that is also being said only by that uh, very same uh, yeah. mm -hmm. the proof of, of uh, the witness is the same uh, thief turned policeman correct no that that is that is the key the idea how pandit lakshman sharma answers that is that <clears throat> uh, you have already assumed you are the body you are already assumed you are the body and therefore you are talking about standing in front of the bus so this primary assumption that you are the sensory body which is also perceived by the senses the body is part of the world and it is perceived by the senses so one small part of the world you have gone and identified and you have said this is me <clears throat> and now you are saying the the statements are so fast that we don't slow them down and that <clears throat> you go and stand in front of, who is this you hardly <clears throat> the the questions being investigated the i cannot be a witness for the truth being investigated because the i is part of the world we are checking whether the world is real the i cannot be a witness because i or any of the senses cannot be a witness because they are part and parcel of the world <clears throat> therefore how uh, the the reality that they say that the reality may be there but it is somehow warped is removed completely by vedanta because to for vedanta <clears throat> the senses are given only as a bridge for us to understand Uh, the senses the mind all these are unreal because they don't survive they don't survive the waking dream and deep sleep cycle <clears throat> so none of them are real according to vedanta but for our sake who are so preoccupied with the sensory world 
and still feel that there is happiness there is knowledge and there is eternal existence still being occupied in the eter- in the sensory world for us to move us inward into <coughs> the mind and into the atma bhagwan is giving us this bridge that world that you perceive is nothing but sensory forms sensed by the five jnanendriyas and those five jnanendriyas are <coughs> used by the one mind to go and uh, perceive the world therefore can that world be apart from the mind that perceives now <coughs> uh, according to vedanta the world the indriya the manas they are all unreal because they don't stand the test of <coughs> the continuity of existence in waking dream and deep sleep now this itself is not a final test in vedanta the waking dream and deep sleep that's not the final test because those three are a dream the waking dream and deep sleep are a dream in another sleep <coughs> that sleep is called as agnana so <coughs> this is what we have to understand that the world of which this verse says is nothing but sensory forms perceived by senses which are perceived by one mind therefore the world cannot be free from the mind obviously this whole series is is not real <coughs> the the entire video that you will find there will be lot of things which question the reality shown by the senses uh, for instance uh, the the person dealing with smell will say that <coughs> Uh, 10% of human beings who have a genetic modification cannot have a particular smell and the person concerned with sight will say that 5% of human beings have a particular modification which <coughs> gives them uh, if they hear a sound they will have a color the that sound will be associated with the color they will be seeing the color along with the sound <coughs> that they call it by a particular name so these are all the problems individual problems that they have with the senses and they know that none of the senses give us a complete picture but vedanta takes it further that the senses perceived by uh, the sensory forms perceived by senses perceived by the mind are all unreal because they don't stand the test of do they exist in deep sleep <coughs> they exist in some form in uh, dream but not of the same sensory nature but of a different nature of a subtle nature in the dream and in deep sleep they are completely off but does vedanta stop there and say that this understanding the waking dream and deep sleep is enough no for vedanta waking dream and deep sleep they are a dream arising in a deep sleep called ignorance so that is where atma vichara takes us it takes us to the root sleep the root sleep that's why when kanakamal uh, sorry when uh, uh, surinagamal asks bhagwan uh, in the letters i am not able to recall which particular letter but if you key it in in the uh, soft copy you will be able to get <coughs> the the reference is surinagamal asks bhagwan do jnanis have dreams that means she is asking do they have sleep also so uh, the the answer from bhagwan is why not in many places uh, he would have said no <clears throat> here he says why not but only difference is that to the jnani even in the dream the dream will be like a dream because for the others uh, the dream will be real but for the jnani the dream will be like a dream he says now <clears throat> this is called as the turiya state the turiya state which is the adara for which is beyond the three states but is still the adara for the three states when the jnani is speaking from in the talks we were reading about 2 3 days back somewhere in the 600s there is a talk bhagwan where bhagwan says <coughs> uh, the 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 supreme the the 
great jnanis they reside in turiya but the supreme jnani resides in turiya tita he says turiya tita is that <coughs> where none of the three states appear that the turiya at least is an adara is a support is a witness whereas that witness quality is also not there in turiya tita that is the state from which bhagwan would have answered many of the answers when he says when jnani has sleep no because he has crossed the root sleep root sleep of ignorance has been removed therefore he doesn't have the three three uh, waking dream and deep sleep he would say but here to surinagama he steps down to the point of the uh, turiya state and he responds saying that why not that we can describe and that is the perspective from which we will we will find shankracharya also say that <clears throat> uh, this uh, sleep is nirvikalpa samadhi his walking is pradakshina all his speech are japa whatever he speaks is japa whatever he does is puja whatever he walks is pradakshina and whenever he is in deep sleep that is samadhi sthiti nidra samadhi sthiti he says from what perspective they have gone to the turiya state which is the three states are there <coughs> and the uh, transcendental state is the adara for the three states but where does bhagwan go bhagwan goes to turiya tita where even the adara is now observed the three states are observed in the one self the self alone is but we have jumped too far ahead but with with point with purpose that <coughs> how unreal the world is uh, what does vedanta say uh, and how lakshman sharma addresses this is if someone says like the scientists do that there is an independent reality independent of the inside there is an independent reality outside then it is for them to prove how it is real <coughs> it is not for the vedantins to prove because vedantins hold that there is no independent reality the the reality there the relative reality is dependent on the senses the senses are dependent on the mind the mind is dependent on something else which we are going to see in the next verse but this is how <coughs> the the scientists who enquire into the reality of the senses they also find that the senses are incomplete they come up to the point of the legend that the senses are like the five blind men that their aggregation has problems they are at many times in conflict with each other they cannot be totally real but there must be a reality of which these are hacks they say that's where <coughs> uh, we find vedanta moves out that there is no independent reality there at all reality has to be found beyond the senses beyond the mind beyond the waking dream and deep sleep the cycle of which it puts aside the senses sensory world and the mind they cannot be real because they don't stand the test of are they continuously present in waking dream and deep sleep are waking dream and deep sleep themselves real no once again that the turiya sthiti that consciousness which is a witness of the three states that is real and these three are not real is turiya the ultimate reality no <clears throat> is the answer that bhagwan gave to suri nagama about the dream is that the final reality in which he is resting which is his nature which is our nature no the turiya tita sthiti where no description is there no explanation is there but your existence is untouched is untrammeled is complete is perfect is purna that alone is real there even that i am a witness of the three states coming even in my dream the dream you are like dream only there is no reality there is no sat there is no sara there is no essence it is all soratless it is it is completely bereft of any kind of reality the dream is a dream for me because in practice of atma nirbhar of relying in the atma sthiti the consciousness has naturally settled down that even if the dream arises there is absolutely no interest in that even in the dream state says bhagwan but that explanation is from the turiya the witness state in the turiya tita there is no such explanation also required there is the self alone which is real but more of that in the next verse which we will see together with verse number 
let us sit in practice for atma of atma ucharam for the next few minutes 13 minutes till 8 o'clock om namo bhagavate shri ramanaya
Prostrations to Ramana, Chinese self in all beings. By the great grace of Bhagwan, we are meditating on the Ulladha Narpada and also practicing the self inquiry because these verses are meant for practice only. The meditation is also from the perspective of practice and this has been followed up by the practice by Bhagavan's grace. My mind goes to three instances with reference to what has been meditated upon today. One, I remember Kanakamba's explanation of the legend of Arunachala, where the great Adi Mudi Jyoti was seen, the, the endless, the limitless light was seen by the great gods Brahma and Vishnu. And Kanakamma said that the, the great gods actually symbolize the the ego and the intellect, the, the one who possesses and the one who knows. Vishnu being the one who possesses or Lakshmi Pati, this belongs to me, this is mine. And, and Brahma in this case, symbolizing or epitomizing the power of the intellect, the Saraswati Pati. And in one of the versions of the legend, we have Brahma flying up in the form of a swan to see the head of this great Jyoti, finding a Ketaki flower, a flower falling from somewhere. And Brahma asks the flower, where from are you falling? Are you not falling from the head or the top of this column? And the flower says, I do not know from where I am falling. But Brahma asks the flower to bear witness to his own statement that he has seen the top. He asks the flower to say, I am falling from the top and Brahma has seen me falling from the top. So this flower is, is obviously something which is much inferior to Brahma. But he takes the support of the flower. He takes the flower to be his witness or support of his argument that he has seen the truth of this, of this column of light. And that is how it is when the intellect takes or intellect or the mind takes the support of the senses to say or declare that the world is real. And that is a fallacy which Nanda Kumarji pointed out to us that the senses are so limited which even those who go into their reality who are studying them like the scientists are ready to concede their limitation and it may be so more because they are also studying it to some extent. Very often we take it for granted. We take everything for granted. We don't go deep into it. We assume knowledge and we b work on the basis of assumed knowledge. Although many Puranas, many stories are given to us to question or wonder about this assumed knowledge and not to trust it, including in the Ramayana, we have Dasharatha who has the capacity to 
distinguish by the sound as to which animal is producing the sound in which direction and when a human being shravan kumar is filling water he takes it to be a wild animal drinking water and he shoots the arrow at this human being thinking he is hunting an animal and because of which he gets cursed that he too will get separated from his son the way he has separated this shravan kumar from his aged parents so it's just because of his of the arrogance of his knowledge he thinks oh i know i can discern which direction this sound is coming from and i can discern which animal is making this sound so there are numerous numberless instances to prove that uh, the senses cannot be trusted and further that nandakumar ji pointed out to us that in fact they all are a part the entire perception is only a part of a dream at best it is dream like when we look at it from the perspe- perspective of being a witness so we see this instance of bhagavan once reporting his dream to chadwick he says that uh, chadwick last night i had a dream and chadwick says what was the dream bhagwan and bhagwan says you know you and i chadwick we were walking down a road there were many buildings on either side and in that dream chadwick i asked you chadwick if i were to say this is a dream what would you say and you answered me only a fool would say this is a dream bhagwan reports this as a dream because while in the dream we would all say only a fool will say this is a dream but one who is awake knows that is the reality and it is a dream it is not, it's foolish to say it is real on the other hand we think it is foolish to say it is unreal and finally we have that example which nanda kumar ji often quotes to us from the talks which has been mentioned by bhagwan in the talks of the other extreme we started by looking at brahma giving false witness the intellect giving false witness and we have the same intellect which can take us beyond itself when one realizes the import of bhagwan's words when bhagwan narrates this dream to chadwick it would become very obvious to him how unreal is this so called real waking perception as well and why is it unreal because again it has been pointed out to us during the course of today as well because it passes everything passes it does not stand the test of being ever present so it also does not stand the test of being independent that is what the verse is bringing out to us the world is dependent on sensory perception the world itself is unreal because if it is not seen it does not exist the world of sound does not exist for one who is hearing impaired it just does not exist there is no such thing as sound for one who is fully hearing impaired there is no such thing as sound for one who is fully visually impaired there is no such thing as something that is seen there is no color color one who is color blind also sees colors differently but may see color but one who is fully 100% blind or visually impaired does not have a world of that is anything a visually perceptible world doesn't exist at all for such a person so bhagwan is saying that there is no independent existence for any of these they are only relatively present 
they are present only if seen the seen world is present if seen the heard world the auditory world is present if heard otherwise it's not present so it is dependent on the mind and the instance which bhagavan has given us in the talks is of the supreme mother the goddess herself parvati who came down to earth to do penance apita kuchamba herself while doing penance at arunachala had the darshan of this great light this great column of light but and not using her intellect to measure or even exult in the perception of that light she questioned if that light is visible to me am i not more powerful vaster greater than the light which is seen by me so that is how bhagwan is taking us he says that the seen world the, the perceived world the world perceived by the senses is lesser in reality than the senses which perceive them or the senses include that which they perceive the eye includes that which it sees so the world is included in the senses so the world is dependent and included in the senses and the mind being greater than that the intellect being greater than that can see everything can perceive everything that is perceived by each of the sense organs so it is obviously greater than the sense organs or the sensations the gyan indriyas as they are called the sensations are included in the mind and dependent on the mind and included in the mind so bhagwan says the mind alone can be said to be the world in this verse he has stopped with that he has stopped with bringing us to the point of understanding that there is no reality to the question also what is the reality of the mind itself and that is the question which apita kuchamba asked herself i must find the source of my reality not get carried away by that which is seen no matter how wondrous no matter even if it is a vision of all the very arunachaleshwara jyoti stambha even then it has to be questioned and a similar instance happened in the life of shri v ganeshan when he too had this vision of great light and he ran to his mother and he told her i have her his mother nagalakshmi he told her i had this great vision and she said so what and he was deeply disappointed then she said no it is only a vision that you had you must go deeper than that it will pass away and also it is it it is it has different meanings it can carry different meanings to different people and it will distract you when you share this vision with people some will praise you some will laugh at you scoff at you saying this is just your mental imagination and all that will distract you from your main purpose of finding your source so don't worry whether you are having even the greatest of visions don't get carried away get back to the source that is what nanda kumar ji has also pointed out to us will be what bhagavan is going to tell us in the next verse but it is implied over here in this verse as well by his infinite grace om namo bhagavate shri ramana